Okay. Hopefully, oh, hopefully the resolution kicks up. Oh no, is the resolution kick up? Or is this going to be a bit awkward? Right. Um, topic eight. We're going to look at undue influence. Key thing to note here: there are two equitable vitiating factors that we're going to look at: uh, undue influence and unconscionable transactions. And I'm going to do the remedies for each of those separately because the remedies. And the defences and the excuses for these are essentially the same. Okay, I'll say that again. The, we're looking very quickly at undue influence, which is an equitable uh, series of vitiating factors, and, uh, and the next recording will be on unconscionable transaction or unconscionability. And then I'm going to do a separate one, which is the remedies for both, because the remedies for both are the same. Now. Some say, by some I mean academic type commentators, say that undue influence is kind of the equities version of duress. There's no threats. I appreciate this. It's a vitiating factor, again, when somebody's will is overborne, but not through overt threats. Sometimes they can be very subtle threats, but they're not threats, and certainly not the threats to the person, to economic interest or to goods. They might be threatening to break up someone's marriage or to leave someone out of a will or promising to help look after people and then not. I had one community legal matter that involved uh, a person who managed to convince him to buy her a house. And uh, guess what happened after the house was conveyed to her name? Guess what she did? Oh, yeah. Um, however, guess what he had done ahead of time? Made her, made, made her, asked her to be, uh, have a power of attorney. Which is quite sneaky, really. It's actually quite a sneaky little thing. Because you would think, oh, well, that means she can do all sorts of things. No. There's, there's a section, I think it's section 82. Well, it's, I've got it in the next slide which is the, um, the Power of Attorneys Act, 687, I should say, says that undue influence automatically arises. That's a statutory rule. But the way we're looking at here in terms of contract law is that undue influence is and will arise where there is this relationship of trust and confidence. That's the first one, the most common one. Or where there's no special relationship but somebody's will is overborne. So. It comes up a lot. Yeah, like that. There, there's this, yeah, all the time, all the time. The Queensland Court of Appeal has got a series of judgments and do you know what happens? If it makes it the Queensland Court of Appeal, the old people, sorry, the, um, the weaker party in these relationships, they win and they win spectacularly. But you know what the worst part about it, worst part about this, is that there are multiple cases where the Court of Appeal has said, look, this house has gone up in value and it's cost you all of this money. We'll grant you this much money. We'll grant you, you know, a huge sum of money if you'd asked for it, but you didn't. You asked for exactly the amount that you gave the kids and not a penny more. That was all you asked for. We would have given you everything you asked for. But at the end of the day, you know, it was, it was the old lady's you know, daughter and son-in-law that were doing this thing. And she, she didn't want to you know, rip them off in inverted commas. She just wanted her money back when things went sour. Happens a lot. Happens a lot. The granny flat relationship. And so just make note that there's these two categories. The first one, which splits into two types, and sometimes you see them written out. Steve talks about it in his, his book, I think, as well, as uh, category 2A and 2B, we don't use this in Australia, it's only come up a couple of times ever, for um, this relationship of trust and confidence, which comes in two different types. And the other, sometimes they call, talk about uh, uh, type 1 or class A for the second one, this direct overbearing of will. The direct overbearing will is pretty hard. 
to prove, very hard to prove. So we'll get back, we'll get to that, but only at the very end. So this special relationships thing comes in two flavors. The first flavor is where there is one of these categories and only these categories. This is an exhaustive list. And make note, one of those is solicitor and client. Okay, that if you are in one of those special categories of relationship, by default, if you have a contract with that other party, they can go to equity and ask for that contract to be rescinded. That's just the, the default remedy you have for um, under influence. And by default, they win. They win. Undue influence will automatically arise if you're in one of these categories, and I just mentioned will also automatically arise under the statute if you have a registered power of attorney under the Powers of Attorney Act, Section 87. So undue influence will automatically arise. That is a great thing. All you have to prove to the court is what? What is the only thing you'd have to prove? Jordan, this time. Yeah, register power of attorney, or that you, um, you're, in, you're the parent, they're the child, you're the guardian, oh, sorry, you're the child, they're the parent, you're the patient, they're the doctor, you're the client, they're the solicitor, you're the disciple, they're the religious advisor. That's it, that's all you gotta prove. That person was my religious advisor, by default, you win. You absolutely, you just you straight up win. That is the only thing you have to prove, if it is one of those categories. Will, that, will it actually automatically arise? It is undue influence. By default, you automatically win. You, if you, and this is why, if you as a religious advisor enter into a contract with a disciple, make note that equity will automatically set, set that contract aside. Again, subject to the bars to rescission and the other maximum of equity, which we'll talk about in that separate recording next week. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it does. It automatically arises. So just make note, one of those is solicitor and client. So just make note when doing that, as a result, that if you have contracts with your clients, they can automatically have them set aside. Um, and it kind of makes sense. Look, these, these are all, um, uh, all parent-child's not fiduciary, but where you've got these very, 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 well-known classes of dominance. This we in, in law and the courts of chancery and the equitable principles say, by default, we will deem that all situations between these two classes of persons, this person will be able to dominate the will of the weaker party. That is just something we accept in the world. It's a status-based position. It's not one built on the facts. You guys next year will do, well, you, you might actually do equity with me. Suckers. <laughs> um, but the, you'll learn about this distinction between status-based fiduciaries, so employee, employer, you know, the employee owes the employer a status-based fiduciary relationship, uh, duty. Uh, the same with uh, trustees and beneficiaries. All trustees owe their beneficiaries this duty, this very, very high duty at law. These are... Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah, 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 like that, yeah, don't worry. Par Parliament's jumped in, in terms of that. So the, the specific rules of the Legal Profession Act and the Legal Profession Regulations allow you to have um, contracts for service in regards to your clients. You can still be paid. Yeah, yeah, I know, like that. But if you were to then, with your client, I'll come to a second, and buy their house, that's the tricky bit. That's where things are outside the scope of the legal profession, of the legal, of that carefully mapped out doc, um, statutory framework. Yes. Yeah. 
usually you don't get damages in equity. Now, it's a little bit contentious because we can argue uh, this thing called Lord the Lord Cairns Act, um, and there's a bunch of other remedies, things like constructive trusts. Usually you don't get dollars. You get the right to undo the contract. Now, courts for a long time have recognised that that's a, a wholly unsatisfactory um, solution in many situations, but that is the default rule. So people can still today rock up to, to court and say, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll grant you a remedy. Yes, you can undo the contract. That's the default remedy. If that can't happen, no remedy. That can happen. Um, there is scope for doing things under a statutory framework, an old statutory framework, but they very rarely use it. Um, and, it's, and also note that for doctor patients slash the client, there are compensation schemes as well for solicitors doing naughty things. Now, whether or not selling your, your house and think would, would be funded by um, Lexa or whoever the law society's insurer is, I don't know. That's outside the scope of my knowledge of the insurance scheme. But it certainly is the case here that if you, as a solicitor, yes, you can take a client on, yes, they can pay you. Logically, that, that works. But if throughout the course of this transaction that they're having for a house, they're trying to find a buyer, and you say, oh, I'll step in, I'll be the buyer, alarm bells should be going up everywhere in relation to that, because by default, they can have it set aside. Okay, now, that's fine for this exhaustive list, small list, half dozen uh, categories, and what are some things that aren't there? What are some powerful relationships that we have in our day-to-day -day life that aren't husband and wife is not there um, and uh, so these things are yeah they're curious in terms of how they they, they pan out there this terms of undue undue influence it doesn't go there are some other rules um, the rule in Yerkin Jones but I, I don't think I'd go go into that here but just make note that these situations that the courts have said, you can try and prove it, you can try and go and argue, but you're arguing under what we call the class 2B. If they're not in one of those exhaustive categories in the previous slide, you can still actually rock up and try and prove that this particular relationship is one of on, on the facts of special trust and confidence. So if you do have, sorry? Uh, because I, that particular case involved brothers. Yeah, sisters the same, sorry. I should have brought, I didn't really think of that in terms of, um, yeah, brothers, sisters, cousins. The, yeah. yeah, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And it's one of those things, like, I mean, I'm, I'm teaching admin law this semester too, and one of the key things I know with that particular subject, it's all about power. And it's very, very noticeable that from the beginning of that subject to the end, all of the people who do it become more powerful when dealing with government, because that's what it's about. Here, you guys gain a lot of power in your day-to-day um, you know, -day and commercial dealings. You will know what the rules are. You will know the limits to people's power and contractual arrangements, and you'll certainly learn rules like this that you leave in the back of your minds as gotcha moments. Because this is still the common law of the state of Queensland and the Commonwealth of Australia. And even though these things come across as very theoretical, you know, we're talking these, you know, these ye old rules of ye old England, you find that the collection of these little bits of, and I'll, I'll loosely say common sense, the collection of them is not common. I used to say that about business degrees. A business degree is seriously, each little thing is common sense, but in entirety it's not. And law is a mixture of common sense and crazy, completely unsensical rules that make no sense at all. When we do, um, when we do the uh, uh, compensation and damages in, in contract, you'll be looking at that and, yeah, be, be scared for the world. But here, these are just a set of rules that have existed you know, since the days of ye old England. It is still the law and the legal system as we, um, as we have it. Okay, so this Johnson and Buttress, this um, 
that uh, legal strategy is that you, as the plaintiff, must rock up to court and first prove that a relationship of trust and confidence exists on the facts. So, you know, you have a best friend and you need to demonstrate that you would always listen to their advice. They advised to do this and you did that. They advised to do this and you did that. They then advised you to enter into a contract to sell them a house and you just did that because you trusted them. All right? They're not one of the established categories, but if you can prove this relationship of trust and confidence exists, then you can succeed in action under your influence. It becomes a two-step process. And just make note, when I say before, if you're in an established category, you automatically succeed, the other side do get a chance to rebut that, to actually go through and um, adduce some evidence to try... Sorry? In situations where there is a... Um, undue influence arises, by default you're going to win. You're going to have the contract undone. But there are some mechanisms the other side can use to try and keep the contract at foot. And I'm going to do that as in a separate recording, and we'll do it tomorrow because it's the same as it is for unconscionable transactions. But, uh, but just make note at this place that this, the first that list of exhaustive categories, the five categories, if you're in one of those, tick, tick the box, you win. You're going to, undue influence will automatically arise. If it's not one of those relationships, but you reckon you can make an argument that you and the, the, and the other person contracting with were in a special relationship of trust and confidence, and you can prove that on the facts and balance and probabilities, that this relationship was one which ought to be considered in the same light as one of those five or six earlier ones we had. So much so, whenever the person, you're the, the weaker party, they were the more dominant one, you would always listen to their advice. And this can happen with strong friendships. It can happen with carers for old people. Remember, they're not in those, that relationship. That, that happens quite a lot. And um, in fact, um, uh, Lane Hancock, I think, did he have like a, a Filipino wife or carer or something? She was, the, I think it was the maid or the carer or something, and then married him. And they, this was one of the arguments that they made was that, that you know, these things were, the, the will was overborne at some stage. And it does happen. Carers for people get given gifts, sometimes large gifts. And then courts are then obliged to go through and analyze them using these principles to have gifts. And in that situation, it's gifts, not even a contract. But the rules of equity still can apply. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, there are. All of that stuff is, is governed by regulation and the, um, and the criminal law as well. Okay, um, the very, very finally, final slide is this the class or type of undue influence that doesn't have a relationship. There's no relationship of trust and confidence, either one which is presumed or one that is established on the facts. Don't have any of that. They talk about this general domination and how it's influencing the mind of another person. And usually they say that it happens over a long period of time. So much, so much so to impair their decision making, their will to enter into a contract, a genuine contract at arm's length. It, it looks pretty hard, it's pretty hard to prove. Um, the key thing to note is that usually it can't be done on the spot. It has to be done over a long period of time. So that actually, and when we say done over a long period of time, to induce the person into the particular transaction. Oh, you know, um, in here, oh, was this the Krishna, International Society of Krishna Consciousness, that even though this person isn't a believer of this particular place, so no, you've got no relation with trust and confidence, confidence, either established or non, over a long period of time, sending them out bits of information, suggesting that they go and convey their property or whatever it was to do them, doing that. That is an argument that can be made. It is a pretty high bar to go through and do that. Um, but... Again, it can, can happen, it can happen. And again, this is, this is one where, again, the carers can come in as well, where there's not, strictly speaking, a relationship between people. It can just be a suggestion, even if that special relationship doesn't exist. Um, that dominance that can happen over a long period of time. Okay. Oh, okay. 
um, usually these things involve natural people. Um, those things I can't, uh, because the, the, it has to be on a personal level, it, this, this aspect of it. It's all very much tied up with the conscience of the person. Unconscionable transactions can involve businesses and do um, here. And look, I suppose it's strictly speaking, it could if you had a, like a closely held business. And the, so the plaintiffs could end up being um, companies, uh, the plaintiffs or the defendants could end up being uh, companies, but it's, it's really about the individual person in terms of overbearing um, their will from a personal level. Anywho, I'm going to leave that one there. And like I said, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the defences to this we'll talk about uh, when I do, after we've done the general principles of unconscionable transactions. So I'm going to leave that one there.